Hey everybody, we're back for part two of Anatomy of a Knife. Hello, Marshall here again. Did you know every little part of a folding knife has its own purpose and name? So stick around and we'll find out. Today, we're going to cover the parts and features of a few different types of folding knives so that you can better understand what they are and how they work. Now, grab your front row seat and let's jump right in. Now that we're all cozy, let's talk about the types of folders we have today. So, like the last video, these folders are pieces from my collection and some of them are users, some of them are strictly collectibles. So again, if you see any scratches or blemishes on the knives, don't pay much attention to them. They're well loved and cared for and well used. So we have a few different styles, the most common styles of folder here for you today. And I have multiple examples of each, but this is what we're gonna start with to go over the basic parts. We're gonna start with explaining what each of these are. So first we have the slip joint, the oldest, these are a non-locking knife. Often they can have multiple blades, anywhere from a single blade all the way up to what most people know as a Swiss Army knife, which can have tools and blades and magic tricks up their sleeve and do all sorts of wide variety of things. Then we move on to the lockback, which is what most people are familiar with. And the lockback is typically a single-bladed locking knife with a lock bar back here that you pinch down and disengage and then the knife will close. Next we have a liner lock, which liner locks, they're very old. They, they go back into the late 1800s. However, they were never patented until the 1970s when a gentleman, a custom knife maker by the name of Michael Walker patented it. And so he patented it as the Walker lock. And many people will call a liner lock the Walker lock depending on how they were exposed to this kind of mechanism. Lastly, we have the frame lock. The frame lock is virtually the same as a liner lock. However, it is incredibly more beefy and will take considerably more punishment. We're gonna go ahead and start with all the features of the slip joint. So, folding knives have the same blade features as fixed blades often, but there's sometimes a few extras. In the case of this doctor's knife here, or also known as a pill buster, we have our point, our edge, we have a swedge, we have the spine, we have a sharpening choil, we have the ricasso and tang area, there's a pivot hole back here that rotates around a pin, we have this area here, which is called blade stop, or some people call it a foot. And it rests when in the closed position, it rests against your spring bar. And then we have this channel that looks like a fuller. However, this is not a fuller. It does, in this case, work similar to a fuller in a case of weight reduction. But its primary task on this knife is a nail nick. So it allows you to get your nail in there and pull the blade open. Many slip joints have a feature, a flat spot on the end of the tang that's called a half stop that pauses the knife midway. This is not so much for the opening but for the closing because it stops it, reminds you to get your fingers out of the way, and then at a certain point once you cam over the bottom corner, the blade will just quickly and sharply snap shut. This one here, instead of a second blade, it has a spatula. These knives were typically used for making tonics and cough syrups. Back in the 1800s, liquid medicine didn't store well. So liquid medicine was done in the case of, a, or in the form of a pill. And these knives, you would cut your pill into small parts with the blade, use this flat back of the knife to mash it down into powder and then the spatula would be used to scrape up the powder to dip it into your tonic water and then you could stir the tonic water with the spatula and some doctor's knives will actually have milligram markers that go up the spatula 
But most more commonly what you see in a slip joint is multiple blades. And like I said, you can have a single blade or, you know, a company called Victor Knox, this classic Swiss Army knife. They have a couple models that go all the way up to like 50 blades and tools in the handle. So now we'll move on to the handle here. Slip joints typically have bolsters. These can be a separate piece or like this here where we're sitting on three brass liners. These three thin sheets of brass evenly space out the different components of the knife. These bolsters are pinned very precisely and ground smooth so that you can't see the pins. Trapped underneath the front bolster here, we have a pivot pin that goes through the blade and the spatula. There's no bushings or bearings or anything in these. These knives are typically pinned together throughout history. However, nowadays we're starting to see a few here and there made with screws. These silver stripes back here, these are called spring bars. So they function as a backspacer. They also are your spring tension. As you see here, when I start to pull the knife out, we flex the, the spring bar backwards, creating tension. When we get to the half stop, it becomes an arrested position. And then as we get to where we cam out, it snaps down and pulls the blade all the way open. Same thing happens for closing. We get to the half stop, we then cam over the corner and we reach a point where the spring tension sucks the blade back in. This is a very basic mechanism. There is a shelf right here that this spring bar just sits on. It doesn't lock in or engage. These knives have no lock, but they do have a bias to the open position. The handle here is a dyed jigged bone. This knife features something called an escutcheon plate. And this is where you could have a, your initials engraved or a logo for the company, depending on how they wanted to do it. Escutcheon plates can come in many different shapes, typically very classic and elegant. On this escutcheon plate, we have the designation 925 for uh, SS for sterling silver. This is your basics parts for a slip joint folder. How you would care for a knife like this, you can put a drop of oil into the pivot assembly. You don't want to do too much because then the spring bars will slide around and it might close a little easy. You would rinse them out with water. You can collect pocket lint in the blade well area. The only way to get it out is to either scrape it out or rinse it out. And then you would sharpen it like any other knife. So that is the anatomy of a slip joint. Now we're going to move on to what most people are probably familiar with, and that is the lockback. Again, starting with the blade, we have all the traditional components. We have a point, an edge, a sharpening heel, the ricasso tang area, a spine, your bevels, and again with the nail nick. On this knife again, it's still just on one side, and then we have a foot area or blade stop that rests against the back spring lock bar. These knives, the lock mechanism is very simple. It is a pin going through the lock bar. We have again a hidden pin under our bolsters that goes through the blade. Inside the handle or the blade well here, there is a spring bar trapped in your back spacer that creates a spring tension pushing up towards the back of the handle. You push against this to disengage the knife. That keeps the front part here driven down. There is a square engagement area at the front here. That is your lock. It rides on a radius tang and there is a notch that that square engagement point drops into. That's what you hear when you hear the snap and the knife is locked. Depress the lock bar and this uh, engagement point rides along the tang and there is no half stop on this knife. When you get to a certain point, the cam action then allows the spring tension on the lock bar to snap the knife closed, holding it shut in your pocket so it doesn't open up. Now for the handles, again, we have brass liners on this one. We have our nickel silver bolsters that are mounted to them. We have our dyed bone, jigged bone scales. 
Again, completely held together with pins. However, modern versions of this are starting to come with screws. And some of these are even starting to come with bearings in the pivot area. Again, we have an escutcheon plate. This one is uh, very basic. The company has chosen to put their logo on it in this case. Again, with the service, you would just remove lint and debris from the blade well area. You can put a drop or two of oil in. Again, you don't want to use too much. You'll also want to come in and periodically use something fine and clean out any pocket lit or whatnot from the lock engagement notch. You would adjust tension on the blade by peening the bolsters with a hammer should it ever come loose and begin to wobble. And then, of course, you sharpen it like you would any other knife. Again, a very basic system. These are well over a hundred year old design. The slip joints go back much farther. And that is your anatomy of a lockback. Now, we move on to the liner lock. So, we go back in history, back to the 1930s, uh, 1920s, even the late 1800s, and your liner lock was typically a brass liner that would bend over and engage against the tang of the blade, very much like a doorstop at the bottom of a door. It prevents it from moving into the closed position. However, in the 1970s, when it kind of was rediscovered, they started making them out of steel and titanium for the lock bars. This knife here features titanium liners, just like the brass parts, these are called liners. They are your basic framework of the, the knife. This knife has all your basic blade components, your point, your edge, your heel is just where the knife stops, or the edge stops being sharpened. We have a nice big flat point. This will engage against the stop pin, which is back here. We have a thumb stud made out of titanium and gold. And then our bevels, of course. And how a liner lock works is you have your stop pin here. This can be hidden on some uh, liner locks. It can be visible. And then we have our lock bar that engages to the lock face on the blade. How this works is when you open the knife all the way up, you make contact with the stop pin. The lock bar kicks over. This traps the blade between the two points, making for a very rigid lock that is easy to disengage by just simply pushing that liner to the side. You can barely see it. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but down inside here on the lock bar, pressed into it is a very tiny ball bearing. That ball bearing, when the knife is closed, because there is no spring tension to really stop the knife from opening, engages into a divot in the side of the blade that ball bearing is called a detent, and the divot is a detent hole. If you watch very carefully at the lock bar as the knife enters the closed position, the lock bar moved ever so slightly towards the blade. That means the detent ball that's pressed into the liner lock bar it engaged with the detent hole on the blade, and that creates a little bit of resistance, not a whole lot, to hold the blade in the closed position, preventing it from coming open in your pocket. Now again, we have bolsters on this knife. These bolsters are titanium. They are carved and anodized. This knife, everything is held together with very tiny screws. We have a backspacer between our liners. This one has been file worked. It is titanium. The only purpose of this part is to be a piece of material that the screws hidden underneath our scales can thread into holding the liners to it. And that holds the, the basic handle assembly together. It maintains even spacing between the liners so that your blade centers correctly with this type of lock because you have a spring bar, which is your lock pushing the blade to the side, you wanna pay attention to blade centering. How you check blade centering is you look at the point and you want to make sure it's at the halfway point between the two liners. This keeps everything running in a true path where it won't rub or scuff the blade. 
against the handle frames or liners. This pivot has uh, liner locks typically use washers, sometimes bearings. Bearings are more common nowadays, but a lot of people like a washer or bushing in there. The washers or bushings, like in the case of this one, this one is phosphor bronze, but they can also be made out of nylon, Darolin, or uh, Teflon, and they make for a nice smooth action. With this knife, how you would service it is you would rinse it with water. You can go in and clean out any lint that's trapped in there. The um, blade, you can drop a couple of bits of oil down in there. With bushings, oil isn't always needed. Sometimes it can make more of a mess than help. Most of the materials that washers are, have that are made out of, they, they have their own lubricant qualities to it. So that is the basics of a liner lock. Now, sometimes a liner lock isn't tough enough and we come into the frame lock. The frame lock is virtually the same. There are some differences, but it is pretty much always much more heavily built. So again, starting with the blade, we have our point, our edge, our sharpening choil, we have our swedge, our ricasso area, the spine. This one utilizes a cutout instead of a thumb stud. This allows you to catch the blade with the cutout and cycle it open. You can also catch your middle finger from the other side and flick it open. And this frame lock has a flipper tab up here. This is called a front flipper and you would just push on that and cycle the knife open and into the locked position. These knives tend to be more overbuilt, thicker materials, tougher materials. This uh, handle frame is uh, titanium. Even though there's no scales on this, you wouldn't call this a liner. It is a frame, hence the name frame lock. Frame locks almost always have bearings in them. However, sometimes they can have washers. Some people prefer washers. But these bearings are caged bearings. I'll demonstrate that later when I, I'm going to take this knife apart for you and show you some of the internal components because this one has the most internal components of any of the knives that I've shown you. Those bearings right against the flat Ricasso tang area of the blade. And then there are steel washers underneath them that have a machined channel in it that keep the bearings running concentric around the pivot, making for a nice, very smooth, very easy action. Now, titanium against the steel lock face, it can gall. With liners, there's not a lot you can do about it. You can uh, try and harden the titanium a little bit, but there's not a lot of room to go with hardening titanium. You can carbidize the edge, which is, or the carbidize the lock face of the lock bar. Carbidizing is a process that deposits a very thin layer of carbide, which is a very hard material, on the face of the lock bar. This will help reduce galling, galling and sticking. However, a lot of frame locks with this screw right here have a nested in lock insert. That lock insert is made out of steel. It creates a steel-on-steel -steel interface, which makes for a very smooth lock engagement, and it reduces wear. Because the steel is harder than the titanium, it is less resistance to wear, and as you use and cycle the knife throughout its life, the titanium wears away very slowly, creating larger tolerances and gaps, and it can create some play in the lock over time or it'll lock up and it'll mar or gouge the lock face and create a stick, sometimes even just get stuck in the open position and you have to stick something in there and pry it to unlock it. So these lock inserts make for a much more smoothly operating knife. Now, if you look down in our lock cut slot here, a piece of steel traveling across there, many companies and custom makers opt to use their lock insert also as what is known as an over travel stop. 
Now, the over travel stop prevents you from pushing the lock bar over too far and diminishing the spring tension on the lock bar. Here you can see these two cutouts. This is a lock well. This allows you access to the lock because your channel is still pretty thin. If this was just two flat pieces of metal, you'd really be kind of cramming your finger in there. There would be sharp edges. It wouldn't exactly be pleasant to unlock this knife, but these channels, this relief cut here is your lock well. We have a lock cutout. The purpose of this here is trying to bend this thick piece of titanium would be very difficult. It would create a tremendous amount of side load on the knife, causing the blade to bear into the other handle frame. So frame locks typically have a lock cut out. Sometimes it's on the outside, sometimes on the inside. There's lots of different things you can do to make it look nicer. But it thins the material, creating a more natural spring where everywhere this these handle frame is overbuilt, but in this one area, it's thin like a liner. We then have our backspacer. Again, it gives us anchor points for the handle frame to hold everything together and creates an even spacer to allow the blade to run true and straight and remain centered. Then we have our pocket clip. And the pocket clip is exactly that. It's not meant to clip on a belt. You can ruin a pocket clip clipping it onto a belt. You can clip it onto the fabric of the waistband of your pants if you don't have a pocket. That's perfectly acceptable. But typically these should have a little bit of spring tension. Uh, they shouldn't be too stiff. If they're too stiff, you're going to have problems getting into your pocket and back out. Now you want a nice ramp on the cleat of your pocket clip. You want it to slowly build tension and sl as it slides into the pocket and then you want a little bit steeper on the back side so that there's a little more resistance on pulling out so it doesn't just slide right out your pocket while you're driving or uh, sitting in a chair or a booth at a restaurant you want it to have some retention without having this clip super stiff pocket clips can be very stylized they can look a million different ways they can be different thicknesses have cutouts be solid be as wide as the knife handle, be a skinny little bar. It really comes down to the designer and knowing that the designer understands the ratio of material versus thickness and width to have enough strength in the lock bar but still be uh, snappy. So this is the basic components of a frame lock. I am going to go ahead and cut away and come back to this knife disassembled so that I can show you the internal parts because these have a little bit more going on on the inside and I will demonstrate the detent that we mentioned in the liner lock. This knife has a detent as well and the detent is actually handled differently on this knife because of the lock insert. So we will return here in a couple of moments. I'll have this knife all disassembled so that you can see the internal components. After that, I'll show you some different representations of the type of knives that we've featured in the video today. Okay, now that we have this all taken apart, we can go over what the individual parts are. So first off, we have the blade. And as I said before, you know, this is the Ricasso area. This would be the tang. Over here is your flipper tab. The pivot hole goes through the tang. This is our floating stop pin. It's a pin that is pressed in and permanently installed to the blade. And how this stops the knife is on the inside of our handle frame, we have a channel that that pin rides in. And it has predetermined start and stop points, which basically index where the blade is going to stop in the closed position and where it's going to stop in the open position. And then again, on the lock side, it has the same thing, and when it's open, it'll be, and locked open, it'll be stopped here at the end of this channel and wedged between the lock face of the lock insert. Now, we have some machined out pockets here on both sides. Those are simply for weight reduction. We have our pivot assembly. 
which is a male and female screw. So this one is has a threaded shaft, this one has a threaded tube. These are precision made and the blade rides on the female portion of the screw. Now we come back to our, well it's still in our pivot assembly actually, we have caged bearings. And these caged bearings are little ceramic ball bearings trapped in a Darylin housing and uh, they roll very freely. Uh, they're very lubricant, um, very low friction on ceramic. And then for the handle side, we have these washers that have a little channel concentrically around the hole. And this is a balled channel, meaning that the bearings will just nest right in here and roll and stay within that channel and that drops into this center pocket here. And that keeps everything in alignment for nice, smooth action. Now we come back a little farther to our lock. This is our lock insert and our over travel stop. So this nests right into here and uh, it'll snap in. Well, we got a little bit of pocket lint that was trapped in there. But this nests right in this spot and just clicks right in. We have our ball detent, which is that ceramic ball bearing I was telling you about. And that is right into the walk insert. And it sits protruding so that it can drop into the detent hole on the blade in the closed position and create a bias to the closed position. Now this little loop round portion up here that protrudes out the top, snap this into place here, rises up into the handle and when you push it becomes trapped by the handle frame and prevents you from overextending the lock bar and bending this thin web in the wrong direction. If you bend a lock out too much, you reduce the spring tension and that can very much affect your action. And then of course we have the screws for the, the backspacer, the screw for the lock insert. Our backspacer is a floating backspacer. So what this means is there is no threaded holes in here. It uses standoffs, which are these little barrels here. They're threaded internally. They have a shoulder that nests right into the handle frame. And by building a knife this way, where these standoffs go in there, they are a perfect fit and they guarantee exact lineup of the components every single time. This gives you a more precision build on the knife. And then the backspacer will just drop right over and snap down into place and you have your backspacer assembly. And then of course we have the pocket clip which is nothing but a little three-dimensionally machined clip with a little bit of spring and then the screws for that. And this is the basic guts of a frame lock folder. This has m m almost all the options you could have in a frame lock folder. And so you can see it's pretty simple, but there's actually a lot of well thought out things going on inside of here. Now, we're gonna move on to just showing you a few examples of how these designs can vary. So with liner locks, where we originally looked at this one, we saw the liner is ex the liners are exposed all the way around. Um, that is not always the case. For instance, we have this knife here. This is a liner lock. It has a full metal body. It looks like it's one piece, however it's not. This titanium piece back here is a, uh, a cover. This liner lock has frames. 
on it, and then the liner is a small separate piece that is inlaid on the inside of the handle. So this knife has both a frame and a liner. And uh, that is something we're seeing more and more in uh, more modern knives. With frame locks, you can have what's known as a uh, nested frame lock. This knife here, you can see that the frame lock, you don't see that line cut out because it's hidden by an inlaid scale of handle material, in this case carbon fiber. It matches from side to side. It's a very attractive feature on a knife, uh, generally a little bit more upgraded, but it will be able to conceal part of the frame lock mechanism. And this would be called a nested frame lock because that scale material is nested right in there and conceals part of the frame lock. Then we have bolster frame locks. And bolster frame locks are where it's similar to the nested, except you can still see part of the frame lock material. And as you can see here, this frame lock comes out from the center and swoops down and under following the decorative machining on the front part of the frame or bol integrated bolsters. And uh, you can see that there's no real rules as to what a frame lock has to be shaped like. It just has to get to the locking face of the knife. That is a pretty good rundown of everything that we've got going on in the anatomy of a folding knife. Of course there's more you can learn but this gives you the basics, and with this knowledge here, you'll be able to figure out what's going on in the different variations that you're going to find in your journey into knives. So I'm going to hop back out to regular view here, and uh, we will wrap this thing up. So now that we covered the basics on these four types of folders, it's important to know that there are many more types of folding knives with very specific parts unique to those styles. But what we covered in this short video series gives you the basic understanding of why your most common knives are made the way they are and why many blades have the features they do. If you made it this far, thank you for stopping by and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give that like button a stab and go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss any upcoming content. And make sure you check out our other videos to learn more about Legion Steel, and in case you missed it, check out our most recent video update on our Asgear knife, coming out very soon. As always, take care and stay sharp.